welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're so grateful and honored that already your presence is here in this place. God, we thank you for what's already gone on in the house of God, for the touch of your spirit, for the move of God in our lives, Lord, as we've sang and praised and worshiped you, God. Lord, you are good and we just love you and we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor tonight. God, we ask that as we open up your word, God, that you open us up to receive it, open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we thank you, Lord, that you give us the wisdom and the vision and the direction, the encouragement and the blessing, the strength, God, that we need for each and every day, God, for each and every situation. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. Bless them as you would bless us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Proverbs chapter number 28. We're going to open up in Proverbs 28, verse number 1. Tonight I want to talk to you about a subject called being bold for Christ. Being bold for Christ. As Christians, we ought to be bold for Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, we're going to find out what that means tonight as we go along. A couple of things that we'll, we'll take a look at from the Word of God and, and see some examples. And, and I, as I was studying, I remembered a friend of mine who was attending Cal State San Bernardino a, a, a while back had shared with me a story of how they were on, I, I guess, their, their break in between classes. Maybe it was a lunch break or something like that. And as they went out, there was this common area, kind of like a quad area or a common area that, that the people just kind of hung out and, and, and ate lunch at. And there was one of the, the campus clubs, and, and there was a representative of the campus club who was standing on a little half wall. And, and as they were standing on this little half wall, they were literally shouting at everybody that was around them. Now, this club, from what my friend told me, was a very ungodly club. It was not a club that supported the things that we believe as Christians. It wasn't something that would have uh, uh, agreed with, with the gospel or with the Bible. And, and they were just vehemently opposed to the things of God, and it was evident by what they were shouting at all the people that were standing around or sitting around there in this common area. My friend realized that this person was actually preaching folly to everyone that they could get a, their attention. Anybody that would stop and stare or stop and give a little bit of attention, they would grab a hold of them, they would lock eyes with them, and they would, oh yeah, I come in and listen to what I have to say. And they were preaching from the pulpit of this little half wall there at Cal State University San Bernardino. And my friend was just so taken back by it, and they thought, my goodness, how aggressive, how bold, how brash, uh, uh, you know, this is just ungodly. And they went to prayer, and they went before the Lord, and it just really impacted them. The saddest part of the whole thing is how bold and passionate this person was about something that was in air. Somebody that could be so passionate and be so powerful in their delivery and yet be so wrong in what they're talking about. As Christians, we have the truth. Should have had more than one amen on that. As Christians, we have the truth. And therefore, if we have the truth, then we should be bold and we should be passionate about it. And we should be out there telling everybody that we can. Now, I'm not asking you to go to Cal State San Bernardino and stand on a little half wall in the common area and shout at everybody. But here's what I am telling you to do. I'm telling you to be bold. Proverbs chapter 28 Verse number one says this, Proverbs 28 and verse number one, it says this, it says, the wicked flee when no one pursues. Take a look at the contrast here. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. Now, when I think of a lion, I think of pride, right? I think of bold. I think of no fear. I think of just going after whatever it is. doesn't matter if it's, if it's a wildebeest, a crocodile, or a man, or whatever it is. That lion does not care. It's going after it. In fact, our Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. And therefore, if we're following Jesus, if we are following the lion of the tribe of Judah, then the wicked flee when no one pursues. We see this all the time, right? I, I remember something called Y2K.
What happened? The whole world was all in an uproar because their computer systems were going to crash. We were going to have to dig bunkers in the ground, store up water for centuries, have uh, freeze-dried food that would last the millennia. Why? Because Y2K. Oh, my goodness. Y2 came and gone and nothing happened. The, the wicked flee when no one pursues. How about this? You know, 9-11 happened. And after 9-11, I had a friend tell me that, that they had a, a, a close relative that started smoking because of, because of 9-11. They, started, they just took up smoking cigarettes because they were so nervous and so afraid about what was going to happen. Listen, yeah, I know. Okay, something actually did happen. But that's in the past now. Why are we so worried about the future that we have to take up smoking cigarettes? See, the, the wicked flees when no one pursues, but the righteous... Hopefully, as Christians, we understand our position and our practice as such that we are the righteous that this verse is talking about. Not talking about somebody else. It's talking about you, and it's talking about me. We are the righteous. It, it, the Bible tells us that when we receive Jesus Christ, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when we see something in the Bible that says the righteous, we should say, hey, that's me. Now, what is the Bible saying about me, and how should I act accordingly because of what's said? The righteous are as bold as a lion. Does that mean we go out attacking people? No. Not out to get people, go whack them with your Bible. You better get in church, right? It's not what it's saying. But it's saying that we are to be bold as a lion, that, 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 that we are to be putting it out there. We're, we're to give a shout out. We're to be the ones that know what we know, we know the truth, and that we deliver this in such a way that we're unashamed, unreserved, that we are confident in who our God is and who he has made us in him. See, there are some things that if we're going to be bold as a lion, we need in our lives. A couple of things that we need. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. If we are to be bold for Christ, we need, and a couple of things we'll take a look at tonight, that we need if we're going to be bold. We need these things in our life. Number one, if we were to be bold for Christ, we need, number one, conviction. Conviction. Now, I could have said faith, but, you know, faith, oftentimes you can view it in, in several different ways. Uh, Pastor Luke was describing this weekend the faith, right? Yeah, they're talking about the Christian faith. We could have been talking about that as our conviction is the faith, whatever Christianity says. Could have been talking about, you know, our faith for, for our family, faith for inheriting promises, faith for receiving the blessing, right? Uh, or, or, or even the faith shield, right? The protection that God gives to us. See, faith could be taken in so many different ways. So I chose rather to stay with conviction because even though conviction is a part of faith and belief, I, I wanted to, to get beyond that a little bit in a sense. You, you never get beyond it because faith is what pleases God in your life. So don't, don't get that statement wrong, but I wanted to get outside of just the understanding of faith because a lot of times people see faith and they'll say, okay, believe in the word of God and, and receiving the promises or the faith, the common thing, and all that, yes, but even more than that, a conviction. Even more than that, a convic conviction. What do I mean? This is a firm persuasion. It means you're not going to get talked out of it. This is our convictions that come from the word of God. These are the things that we know and have approved in our life, and you can't get us off of it. See, if you're going to be bold about something, you've got to know what it is you're bold about. Because if you get out there and you open your mouth and you get shot down, you're going to run away like a scared little kitty rather than being bold as a lion. But if you know that you know that you know that you know it doesn't matter what they say, it doesn't matter what they bring up, it doesn't matter who tries to put you down, you can't get me off this, this is mine, I know it, it's the truth, and I'm going to be bold about it. Yeah. Unapologetic. It's a conviction. We have to allow the word to persuade us, to guide our opinions and change our... Let me say that again. We have to allow the word of God to persuade us, to guide our opinions, and to change our minds. See, someone said an opinion is an idea that we pick up and carry around with us. That's our opinion. We pick it up and we carry it around with us. But in contrast, a conviction is something that picks us up and carries us around. Hello. Hello. See, my convictions, and you can get mad at me for saying this if you want to, but I don't care. 
My convictions is what picked me up on August 1st and took me to get a chicken sandwich. Not trying to put anyone down. I love everybody. Okay? But I have a conviction. I have a firm persuasion. And there was a man of God who was bold and said what he believed. And I said, I'm going to go support that person in their belief and show them there's an attaboy and I'm going to get a good chicken sandwich. Hello. <laughs> now get mad at me if you want to, but I still love you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, turn there with me, talking about our conviction. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. No problem. Just know that I love you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 12. Paul the apostle, who had a lot of people hating on him in his day. I mean, just reading the word, man, he had, he had everybody in an uproar. There was the Jews. There was the Gentiles. There was even Christians that were raising their eyebrows at him. There, there, was, there was false apostles that were trying to get people off track that were hating on him. And, and, and there was a lot of people in an uproar. And yet in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 12, he's, he's writing kind of his last words to, to Timothy. And he's giving him some encouragements, and he says, I was appointed to do this. This is my calling. God put me in this place. God's the one that gave me this ministry. God's the one that appointed me. See, Jesus Christ, he said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And that's where he comes along in verse number 12 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. He says, for this reason, because I know that I know that I know. For this reason, I also suffer these things. I will go through the pain. I will go through the rejection. I will go through the trial. I will suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. See, you couldn't get Paul off of this. You couldn't get him away from it. You could not stop him. You couldn't hold him back. They put him in prison. They put him in chains. The chains couldn't hold him. They, 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 tried, to, they tried to send him away. They tried to cover it up. He said, I will not go quietly. I know the will of God for my life. I know what I'm going to do. I know where I'm headed. I know where I'm going. I will not stop until the whole world hears. My goodness, here's a guy in prison. He's in chains, and his letters are going to the four corners of the earth and being read thousands of years later. Why? Because he had a conviction. Preaching a lot better than you guys are saying amen. That's okay. If we are to be bold for Christ, we need some things. Number one, we need convictions. We need to be moved by what we believe. We don't need to just believe it. We don't need to just acknowledge it up here mentally. We need to allow it to pick us up. What wakes you up in the morning, church? What is it that gets you out of bed? What is it that, that's on your mind in the middle of the night? Is it a worry? Is it a fear? Is it a doubt? It's time to replace that with the word of God in your life. Let this move you. Let this bother you. Can I say it like that? Let this get deep on the inside of you where you're sweating about this stuff. You should be so concerned with this that you're consumed with this. My goodness. We've got to have a passion for the things of God and for the word of God in our lives. If we're going to be bold for Jesus Christ. We're going to be bold for Christ. Number one, we need conviction. Number two, we need commitment. This is the resolve to do what's in your heart. So you can have a conviction. You can be bothered by something. You can be ready to do it, but without the commitment, it goes nowhere. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's where we see our spirit and our soul getting together and we take our convictions to a whole nother level. It's where passion meets purpose. This is where we take that conviction, that thing that's bugging us, that thing that's on us, where the spirit is getting, getting it deep down on the inside of us, and we commit to it. Commitment means that you are headed in that direction and you've set your course. That's commitment. You won't be deterred. You won't be deluded. You won't be delayed. You won't go to the right or to the left. You are committed to that. 
track. You are committed to that course. This is my lane. I'm running in it. This is the, the race that God has marked out for me, and I'm going to go in this direction. That's commitment, doing what it takes to get the job done. You're there in 2 Timothy. Turn a couple books back towards the back of your Bible to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 4. We just got done talking about Paul's suffering because he was persuaded he had a conviction. Now let's take a look at what Peter has to say. 1 Peter chapter 4. Last verse in 1 Peter chapter 4. So if you find chapter 5, just go back one verse. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 19. He's talking about suffering for doing right or for doing wrong. It's the context of what he's talking about. Being misused, abused, mistreated, or actually receiving due punishment. Verse number 19, he says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God. See, this is not when you're suffering outside of the will of God. Okay? There is a time in our life where we do stupid things. Listen, Pastor Dan does stupid things from time to time. And I suffer for it. Rightly so. Why? Because you messed up. It's just the way it is. But there is a difference when it comes to suffering according to the will of God. We can't really wrap our minds around this because we hear so much preaching that God wants to bless you, that God loves you, that God gives you grace, all that kind of stuff. And and, and yet we don't understand that there is times that we're going to have to go through the valleys. There is times where we have to suffer some things. We have to go through some pain. See, people don't like this kind of preaching. There's hard work involved. There's toil. There's trial. But without that stuff, there's no godly character, the Bible says. There's no reward at the end of that. See, without it, you're just complacent. You're just idle. There's there's nothing going on. Stagnant water goes bad. And so God says, "I'm, I'm putting pressure on you. I'm allowing things in your life. There's certain things that you have to suffer through so that you can build godly character, so that you can stand in faith, so that you can get stronger. And on the other side, there's a reward, there's a blessing. And so we've got to get our view on that. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Notice that he says, in doing good. That means that when you commit yourself to him, this is not like, oh, Lord, I just commit my soul to you and you take care of the rest, I do nothing. No, God says if you're going to suffer according to the will of God, you're going to have to keep doing what you're doing. I I like how Winston Churchill said, he said, if you're going through hell, keep going. Don't stay there. Don't camp out there. That's why we go through the valley of the shadow of death and we fear no evil. Because God's with us. We've committed our soul to him. He'll take care of that which concerns us. That's what this is all about. Your commitment is not to people. It doesn't matter which way people go. Society's going this way. Education's going that way. Politicians are going up here and the pedestrians are crossing the street. My goodness. Your commitment is not to people. Your commitment is not even to yourself. Mm. I've got to do this for me. Sometimes people say that I got I to gotta, I get right with God for me. That's an okay way, place to start. But don't stay there. Don't let your commitment stay selfish. Because we can let ourselves down very easily. We know that. We've disappointed ourselves. We've let ourselves down. But when you take a look at God, therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. So if your commitment is to God... Realize and recognize that God's commitment is to you as well as to himself. The Bible says he cannot deny himself. Wow. The Bible says that he made a covenant, an agreement, a binding contract in heaven on our behalf. God is committed to us, and he's never let anybody down, including himself. And since he's faithful, we can be bold for him. What does that mean? That means that when you step out in faith and you've committed your way to the Lord, you can go out there and you can do what it is God has called you to do without fear. Let's take it a step further. We know it is God's will for people to get saved. We also know from the word of God that no one is going to get saved unless somebody tells them about Jesus. How can they hear without a preacher? Romans chapter 10. Therefore, everybody in this room is responsible 
to open their mouth and to tell somebody about Jesus. Whether you have a pulpit or not, your pulpit is when somebody's listening. And so you've been appointed as a herald and as a preacher of the Almighty God. And therefore, when you go out, oftentimes we say, well, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know if they'll receive it well. I don't know if they'll get mad at me. I don't know. They'll probably tell me, don't preach to me. Why are you doing this to me? They'll get, I might lose my job. I might whatever. Now listen, when you're getting paid to do a job, you do your job. Okay? Don't be taking that time. You're getting paid to do something. Do it. So on your lunch break and on your time off, that's when now you've got open doors, right? Bring your Bible to the break room. They can't say nothing about that. Open it up. Anybody want to read the Bible with me? Worst they can do is say no. And Jesus said, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. He said, but I don't know. What if somebody says yes, and then I don't know what to tell them? <laughs> it's okay. Write yourself some cliff notes in the back of your Bible. Do the Romans Road or the Four Spiritual Laws or, you know, get something, how to lead someone to Jesus. Write the altar call out. You've heard it enough times at this church. My goodness, you should know it by heart by now. I've heard of so many people. I had a conversation with somebody, you know, and we're talking to them, and they said, oh, yeah, I go to church. Well, listen, you don't get saved just by going to church. Right? And all of a sudden, they're into the altar call. People getting saved all over the place. That's, that's, that's just part of what God has called us to do. How about this? Somebody's, oh, man, I'm feeling terrible today. God, I got this headache and this and that. Be bold for Jesus Christ. Say, can I pray for you? I have never, ever, ever had anybody turn me down for prayer. Even the most staunch atheist will say, oh, yeah, just bring it on. I don't, I don't care. Anything can help right now. <laughs> Doesn't matter if they don't believe in God. If it's going to help them, come on, bring it on. You want to anoint me with some oil or something? You know, go for it. My goodness. Step out. Be bold. Why? Because when you step out in faith, God is faithful and he will take care of it. You have a responsibility to pray and then to leave the results up to God. Either God's going to heal him or God's not. It's up to him. He's faithful. You can be bold for Jesus Christ. The, the bohemian reformer John Hus was a man who believed the scriptures to be infallible and supreme authority in all matters. He had a conviction, and he had committed himself. He died at the stake for that belief in Constance, Germany, on his 42nd birthday. As he refused a final plea to renounce his faith, his last words were, what I taught with my lips, I seal with my blood. My goodness. Listen, nobody is telling us to renounce our faith or we die. Nobody's busting down the doors of this place with guns holding them to our heads. Did you know that they are burning down churches in Africa, killing pastors, hanging them up in their pulpits? See, that's the sort of persecution that's going on. They're breaking down buildings, locking people up in Asia. There are things taking place on the earth realm today that the sheltered American church doesn't even know about. And yet God is calling us to live a loud life, to live a bold life, to be bold as a lion. Listen, lions roar. Lions don't care what other people think about them. Lions are called the king of the jungle for a reason because it doesn't matter. I am who I am. And you and I are following Jesus, the great king, and now he's made us kings and priests unto our God, and he's calling us to live a loud life for him, to be bold for him. What's it going to take for us to be bold for Jesus? Number one, it takes conviction. Number two, it takes commitment. Third thing for today, what's it going to take? What, what do we need if we're going to be bold for Jesus Christ? Last thing for tonight is courage. Courage. We see throughout the Bible men and women of faith who are bold for God. Think about Jonathan, right? Remember Jonathan? Here he is. They're, they're, the, the Israelites are all hiding out in caves in the mountain. They're just kind of sitting there. They're doing nothing. And the king should have been leading the army to go and take care of business. And yet they're just sitting on their hands. They've got no weapons. The only one who has weapons is Jonathan and Saul, his dad. And what does he do? He grabs his armor bearer and he says, hey, man, come on. Let's go take care of some business. Let's go over to the Philistine camp and let's, let's, let's go show ourselves to the garrison, right? Now, the armor bearer could have said, boy, crazy, right? He could have just stopped him right there and said, whoa, 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 whoa wait a second. You've got weapons. I don't. You want to go? Go. 
But he doesn't say that at all. What does he say? He says, hey, whatever's on your heart, let's do it. Let's go. I'm down for anything, Jonathan. Let's go. So they get to the edge, and he says, okay, we're going to show ourselves to them. If they say stay there, we'll stay. If they say come up, we know God's given, given them into our hands. So they go, and they show themselves to them, and they say, hey, get up here, right? Jonathan gets a big smile on his face. Let's go, right? And they crawl up on their hands and their knees. Listen, the Bible records this for a reason. Because a guy climbing up a hill on his hands and his knees should not be able to overtake a garrison of enemy soldiers outnumbered, outweaponed. He should not be able to, and yet he does. He goes and he routes the whole garrison. His armor bearer is going behind him just tagging the people that he put down, you know. He's just killing people left and right in his wake after Jonathan puts him down. And what happens? Confusion starts in the camp of the enemy. They're fighting each other. And all of a sudden, all Israel comes out of their hiding place and says, what's going on, man? I hear an uproar. The ground is shaking. Things are taking place. Why? Because one man had a conviction. He had committed his way to God, and then he took courage, and he climbed up that hill on his hands and his knees. Okay, what about David, right? Here's a little boy carrying some lunch to his brothers on the battle lines. And yet he had a conviction in his heart about God. And when he heard the enemy cursing his God, his convictions rose up on the inside of him. And he said, I'm going to take that guy out. Isn't there a cause? What are you guys doing? Why is this guy still talking? And he commits himself to go and to fight this Philistine. What's he do? He runs towards him. Bible says he ran towards the army to attack the Philistine. Wow. That wasn't just David going against the, the, the one-on-one. That was one-on-one on the army behind him, right? And what's he do? He takes courage. He takes that slingshot. He sinks a rock in the dude's forehead and then cuts his head off afterwards. My goodness. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had convictions, committed not to bow before the image of gold, and courageously stood up to the king. And God backed them up by not allowing them to die in the furnace. In fact, there was a fourth man in the furnace with them. Love what General William Sherman said. It was from the Civil War era. He said, I would define true courage to be a perfect sensibility of the measure of danger and a mental willingness to endure it. See, all the men and women that we see in the Bible, they knew exactly what they were up against. They knew that they were facing death, they were facing pain, they were facing rejection, they were facing all these things, and yet they knew that God was on their side, and they were willing to put it all on the line because they knew that God would back them. My goodness, church, we can step out for Jesus Christ. We can tell somebody about Jesus. We can pray for somebody. We can encourage somebody. We can be bold. We can tell someone about our faith. We can bring our Bible with us to work. Hey, we can bring our Bible with us to church. Come on, somebody. Hello. We can do what God has called us to do, be what God has called us to be, and look foolish doing it to the world, and yet know that our God is going to back us up. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God to those who believe. When you know God's on your side, you can be bold. Hallelujah. You're there in 1 Peter. Turn with me to the book of Acts. Let's bring this home to you and I. You know, we've heard a lot of examples about wars and fights and death and a furnace and things like that. But what about us? Those stories are encouraging and they, they get us really excited, but what about our everyday life? Acts chapter 4. Let's bring an example that's real to you and I. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had been arrested. The reason why they were arrested is because they went and they prayed for somebody and they got healed. Plain and simple. That's all they did. Guy was 40 years old, and here he is jumping up and down, leaping, proclaiming the glory of God, and they arrest Peter and John. They threaten Peter and John not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And Peter and John say, well, hey, wait a second. Should we listen to you or should we listen to God? And, and, and the religious leaders are, are saying, well, wait a second. We can't do anything to these guys because everybody believes that this is a miracle from God, that God is backing these guys. So if we lay a hand on them, we look like the bad guys. So they threaten them severely. They tell them, listen, you speak in this name again. We're going to punish you. You'll be crucified. We're going to hand you over to the Romans. We're, you know, and they threaten them. So we're going to lay many stripes on you. We'll beat you. We'll keep you imprisoned. You better not speak in this name again. 
and they release them. Take a look at what it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. The, the disciples go back to the company of believers, and then there they describe what's going on. And they say, hey, we were threatened. They finally released us. And they go immediately to prayer. Look at what, what takes place. Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. Acts chapter 4, verse 29 says, Now, Lord, they're praying. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they're in prayer and they say, Lord, look at what they've said. Lord, you know exactly their threats. See what they're telling us, God. And because of what you see, Lord, in face of persecution, in face of threatenings and trials, God, we pray that you would grant us boldness. That's their prayer. And that, Lord, as we're bold, that you would back us up with miracles, signs, and wonders, stretching forth your hand to heal. Now look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke... The word of God with boldness. That means that God answered their prayer. Now let's bring it home to you and I. Here we are in this church. Here we are talking about a lot of stuff. A lot of things going on. If you watch the news, you'll see that there's just dividing lines here. The nation was united for the Olympics and now we're divided for the elections. My goodness. And so here we are, there's dividing lines, there's all sorts of social things going on, there's all sorts of educational things going on, different things are taking place, different issues on the, on the line, and all things are pulling people apart, and there is tremendous persecution, and the world is being very bold about their opinions, and their beliefs, and their convictions, and the church is sitting on its hands, being silent. Church, it's time to tell someone about our convictions. I didn't say tell someone about our opinions. No, I, I, I could care less, honestly, how many of us in this room believe one way or another when it comes to the political realm or to the social realm or to any other realm other than the word of God. The thing that we have, church, is that we can be united behind one thing. That's the word of God. United behind our king. And if we know this and we tell someone about Jesus, God will back it up. Doesn't matter who you voted for, doesn't matter who you're gonna vote for, what matters is that we vote Jesus, that we know Jesus, that we tell someone about Jesus, that we pray healing in Jesus' name, that we pray for blessings in Jesus' name, that we pray for provisions in Jesus' name, that we encourage somebody in the Lord. And as we take courage in God, doesn't matter, no one can put us down. I love what Robert Louis Stevenson said. He said, He who kneels before God can stand before anyone. What makes a difference in a person's life is how much of God is in them. You're there in Acts chapter 4. You got time for one more verse tonight? Acts chapter 4 verse number 13. Acts chapter 4 verse number 13. They're being examined by the religious leaders of the day. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Sounds like some of us. They marveled. Look at the last sentence. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Church, as you go out and live your life boldly for Jesus Christ, people ought to look at your life and their jaw ought to drop. Why? Because that's just Joe. What happened to Joe that all of a sudden he's Mr. Chatty? That's just Susan. What happened to Susan that she knows so much? I never knew she knew this stuff about the Bible. Never knew she knew this stuff. See, the Bible says that even if you don't know it, that the Holy Spirit will speak on your behalf. You shouldn't be nervous about what you're going to say. Now, the more you get in you, the more God can get out of you. But even if you don't know what to say, God will take control at that moment, and God will speak through you to someone else. And the world will look at you, and they will realize that you've been with Jesus. That's what makes a difference in our lives. If we're going to be as bold as a lion, we've got to hang around with the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hello. Yeah. 
You are what you hang around. Hang around Jesus. You'll become like him. If we're to be bold for Christ, we need three things. Number one, conviction. Number two, commitment. Last thing that we need, that we saw tonight, is we need courage. We need courage. We need to be a courageous church. That's why God told Joshua, be strong and have good courage, for I'm with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Come on, if you got something from the word of the Lord tonight, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. God's so good to us. I want to talk to some of you guys before you leave tonight. Just give me a couple more minutes of your time, then we'll let you go. God is good to us. Uh, it's been a great time in the word tonight. Great time praising and worshiping the Lord. I believe that you guys really got something from God tonight. And thank you for allowing me the privilege of ministering. But let's not stop there. It'd be a tragedy if we stopped there because what if? What if tonight was your last night on the earth? God forbid that should happen to anybody in this room, but it's a very real thing that this may be it. We don't know. The Lord could come or we could go. It's one of the two ways we'll get out of this place. Either he comes or we go. I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. What if tonight was your last night here on the earth? Where would you end up? Just ask that question of yourself in your heart. Where would you go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Now let's examine your answer because sometimes you can tell a lot about a person's life where they're at with God by their answer. Some of you in this room might have said, well, I don't believe in hell, therefore I'm going to heaven. Well, isn't that convenient? Do you know that in the Bible it talks about hell? Old and New Testament. In fact, Jesus spoke of hell. Therefore, hell's a very real place. You're not going to get out of it just by ignoring it. It's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. We'll go stand on the slow lane of the 10 freeway. You'll meet one face to face sooner or later. Can't just deny hell's existence and it goes away. It's a very real place. God talked about it. Jesus talked about it. It's all through the Bible. Come on. Let's realize what's going on. Some of you might have said, well, I'm going to go to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. You get there your way, I'll get there my way. We'll all get there somehow. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible say all roads lead to heaven? That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You've got to get there one way. Not all roads lead to it. And we understand that in the natural, and yet when it's applied to spiritual things, we just say, oh, yeah, whatever. Do your thing, I'll do my thing, we'll all get there somehow. Listen, let's not get there your way. Let's not get there my way. Let's not get there some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. So we can't get there any other way. We've got to get there God's way. It's his heaven. We've got to get there his way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who started it all, the one who penned the plan of redemption and carried out in his son Jesus Christ, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, don't you think if he went through all that, he would describe how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. A lot of times people stop right there and they say, oh, well, that's good news because, you know, I've been a really good person. I know that God lets good people into heaven, done a lot of good deeds, gave money to charities, been nice to my neighbors. I've been a really good person. Therefore, I'm going to go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere, get a hold of this, nowhere in the Bible to say you can be good enough to get to heaven where you help out, be nice to your neighbors, give money to charity, do a lot of good deeds, and that gets into heaven. It doesn't work like that. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. Why? Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to get there just by being good. There's no grading scale in the back of the Bible behind the maps where it says you have to be this good in order to get into heaven. If that's how you think you're going to get there, you're not going to make it. And I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. Not play games. Some of you might have said, well, but wait a second. Hold on. I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child hung cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized your Christian as a child, and you went to religious classes like Sunday school, catechism class, Sabbath school class, and, and you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nothing could be further from the truth. Why? Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that you are raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nor in the Bible say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or because you're born in America, that that automatically qualifies you for heaven. And again, nowhere do we see in the Bible that it says that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven and denying hell. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Now, some of you might have said, well, wait a second, Pastor Dan. Okay, hold on, because not only did I attend church when I was a child, here I am in church tonight. 
sitting in church right in front of you, and I consider myself to be a Christian. That's great. I'm glad you're here tonight, but could, could you just show that to me in the Bible? Sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's like saying I can sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. At no time will I ever become a car just because I call myself a car. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You say, ah, I understand that, but I, I got you on this one. I, I got involved in my last church, helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made a number of decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card to that church. That's great. Could you show that to me in the Bible where church involvement gets you into heaven? Could you show it to me where it says you make decisions, carry the pastor's Bible, sing in the choir, teach in the classes, get a membership card, that God's waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card before you can enter? It doesn't work like that. Come on. Let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people say, okay, I understand all that, but I know God. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you. That's how well I know God. Old and New Testament. That's great. Glad you can do those things. But could you just show that to me in the Bible? In fact, if you had read your Bible, you'd know that the Bible says demons know who Jesus is. They're not Christians headed for heaven. If you read your Bible, the Bible says the devil can quote scriptures. That doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having some mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and then just because you know God, you get to go to heaven. Listen, everybody in America knows who God is. Everybody in America knows who the baby in the manger was. They all know about Easter and the cross and the resurrection. And yet not everybody who knows that is going to get to go to heaven. Why? Because it's not about what you have in your head. It's not about head knowledge. Rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. Jesus made a statement to a religious leader of his day, who is probably better than all of us in this room, knew more scripture, could quote more scripture, could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? Did a lot of good deeds in his life, was raised up and got involved in his church called the synagogue. Jesus doesn't tell him, hey, you're doing a good job, man. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. What does he say? He says, you must be born again. Now, I know our society has mocked that term. They've raked it to the coals. They've scorned it. It's not about what society says. Rather, it's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end, the Bible's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Well, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? What's lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. But get over it and be bold. Why? Because think of it for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Come on, and what makes you think that if you can't raise your hand in a safe and friendly church service like this, that you're going to live for Jesus Christ boldly outside of these walls? It's not going to happen. So tonight, that's why we're saying heads up, eyes open. Lift your hand before everybody. And listen, it doesn't matter if we see it. What matters is if God sees it. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Remember, the righteous are as bold as a lion. We want you to do this. We're excited for you if you do this. All of us in this room have done this one way or another throughout our lifetime if we're a Christian. And so tonight, 
we're excited for you. No one's going to judge you. No one's going to put you down. Okay? The only reason why we're looking is because we're excited. All right? So tonight, will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God by simply raising your hand in this safe and friendly church service. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe or even online, you can lift your hands right there. Tell an usher or if you can come into the church service or if you're online, click the blue button that says respond to God and then you'll be led in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. There's three up there on top. Three wise people already. Where are you at? There's four. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Four wise people already. There's four. There's five up in the family room. Thank you. Five. Is that one up on top? No? Five. Anybody else real quick? Five wise people already. Six, seven. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Just pop them up. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. There's five wise people already. Anybody else? Wave it at me real quick if that's you. Got you right there. Thank you. Thank you. Six, seven. Anybody else real quick? I got you in the family room. Thank you. God bless you. I already got you, I think. About seven or eight wise people in this place. Anybody else real quick? You know you need to give God all your heart. You know you need to give God all of your life. If that's you, just lift up your hand when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. Let's go for God tonight. Be bold. Be bold. Thank you right there. Eight. Anybody else? Come on, where you at, number nine? Sitting there wondering if you should do this. If you should do this, go for it. Come on. Just know you're out there. Come on, number nine, just lift your hand up real quick. Anybody else? Real quick, just pop it up. That's you. Anybody else? Last call. I'm going to close this thing up. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for eight wise people. Hallelujah. Man. Now listen, all eight of you, or if you're number nine, number 10, number 11, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap. As we do that, I want you to get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, a Bible, a friend if you need a friend. And I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff. Purse, Bible, friend, if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now. Just make it with the front. No one leaves. Let them come right now. You come. I have decided to follow Jesus. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. I have decided to follow Jesus. From the family rooms, you can bring your kids if they need to come. Come on down. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. I have decided to follow Jesus. All right, hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I to follow Jesus. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. You can come too. follow Jesus. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on, just make your way to the front. Let your neighbor say, friend, I'll go with you. Hallelujah. All right, everybody up front, look up here for a second. This is the best decision of your life. You can put a smile on your face. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, all right? Now, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right. See this guy, Pastor Dave? Pastor Dave's a really cool guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen. I'm about the weirdest part of the night, okay? So you already got past me. It's cool from here on out, all right? Pastor Dave's going to do three things with you. I'll let you know what they are in advance so that you're not scared or wondering what's going to take place. He's going to take you right over there, pray with you, okay? Simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, just like we talked about, okay? Brand new from the inside out. You'll look the same, smell the same, but hey, you're new, okay? Now you've got to find out what to do next. And so he's going to give you, secondly give you absolutely free a couple little booklets that our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. 
That's right. He's going to give you a friend. Okay, we call them spiritual personal trainers. They, you heard of a physical trainer in the gym that helps you get buff, helps you get strong, right? Okay, spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. It's a five-week program. They'll teach you five things out of the Bible, one a week. That'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord, okay? Now listen, 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 listen. I got a promise for you. If you give God one year of your life here at the Rock Church, I promise you that at the end of this year, you'll look back on your life and you'll say, wow, I can't believe it's this good. Okay, that's my promise to you. Now that year starts with five weeks with an SPT. He'll describe how it works and then he'll let you come right back out in the church service. So if you guys would make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand. Love you, Pastor Dave. Hallelujah.